have the call to worship. The Lord reigns, let the people tremble. He sits in throne upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in the sun, it is all the people. Let them praise thy great and terrible name, holy is he. Mighty King, lover of justice, God has established equity. Thou hast executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. So, o Lord our God, worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called on his name. They cried to the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them in the pillar of the cloud, for they have their testimonies, and the statutes that he gave them. O Lord our God, thou didst answer them. Thou wast a forgiving God to them but an avenger of their wrongdoings. If so, o Lord, our God, and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord, our God, is holy.
Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world. Grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please join me for a <coughs> time of silent prayer, and I'll pray on behalf of the song. Almighty God, we lift our hearts in prayer this morning as every morning. First of all, in gratitude for you, for your glory, for your love, for your presence with us, for having called us into being and having called us into service in this church and community. We thank you for filling our hearts with the desire to know you more deeply and to serve our friends and neighbors as, as well and deeply as we possibly can. We thank you also for putting into our hearts the care for our whole society and the whole world so that we pray every day for those who are near and far for our sister congregations around the world and uh, for those Christians community, especially who are undergoing persecution for the gospel's sake. And uh, we pray, of course, for those unjustly imprisoned everywhere. We pray for just order in our own society and around the world. And so we pray as every week for Donald, our president, for Paul, our governor, and all those who serve us in public office, whether that office be great or small, local or national. We pray that they will serve us and ultimately serve you uh, wisely and administer the laws with justice and mercy. We give you thanks, special thanks for the prayers we have, for listening to the prayers that we have lifted up this morning. We pray for those who are sick and struggling and for those caregivers and loved ones who bear up their spirit, maintain and maintain morale. May our hearts be full of gratitude and rejoicing for the gift of life, for the gift of family and friends, the gift of being able to gather and worship in a free country, the gift of living in a beautiful place. And we ask your special blessing on all those on our prayer wheel of this congregational church and for hearing those prayers that we have uttered and those prayers that lie as yet too deep for words. We close our prayer time by praying as you cause. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
join me in the spirit of prayer as we ask God for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. In our Old Testament reading, Jeremiah prophesies for the Lord, sadness will turn to joy and hope for restoration. I'm reading Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 15 to 17. It's the New Living Translation that I like. This is what the Lord says. A cry is heard in Ramah, deep anguish and bitter weeping. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for her children are gone. But now, this is what the Lord says. Do not weep any longer, for I will reward you, says the Lord. Your children will come back to you from the distant land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, says the Lord. Your children will come again to their own land. The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant. Though I love them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Our New Testament reading is part of the fulfillment of Jeremiah. We pick it up at the end of the visit by the wise men. This is Matthew 2. Um, verses 12 to 18. When it was time to leave, the wise men returned to their own country by another route. For God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet, I called my son out of Egypt. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under. This was based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning. Rachel weep for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead.
And thanks to all of you who come to Bible study, where we have been looking into the three kings, or wise men, or magi, or sorcerers, or augurers, or whatever you want to call them. Um, we've been looking into who they were, and where they came from, and what they mean for us today. And we'll be thinking about them today, and for the next couple of Sundays, for Epiphany <coughs> is their season. The three kings, or wise men, are great characters in the history of salvation. They are not the main characters, but they support the main character. They bear witness with their presence and their gifts to the main character, namely God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, who in some mysterious fashion, all three in one person, are the main characters in the history of salvation. In our Bible lessons for today, we hear God speak through the prophet Jeremiah. This is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be our people. Isn't this our hope, that somehow God has put his law within us, <coughs> written it upon our hearts so that we know how to act and how to behave. This indeed is our hope that the new covenant makes us God's people and God's godly people. Jeremiah spoke this promise of salvation, this promise of relationship <coughs> long, long ago, and somehow the wise men, however many there were, got the message and showed up at the beginning of the main event, the appearance, the epiphany of Jesus as an infant. And it would not be Christmas without them. Just as it would not be a good life if we did not have periodic visitors bearing gifts and good news. Sometimes visitors can show us something that we do not see ourselves. All the world's cultures have admonitions to honor the visitors, the strangers in our midst, and the Bible is full of such admonitions. To welcome the stranger, to protect the defenseless, to care for the injured by the roadside. If for no other reason than that you might someday learn from them. The old story of the lion and the mouse comes to mind. You never know when the unlooked for person could do something most extraordinary. Today we also hear another biblical theme, that salvation takes place despite all the detours along the way. Today we hear the story of one of the cruelest detours taken by history. The Feast of the Holy Innocents is what we're hearing about, or the Feast of the Holy Innocents is the traditional celebration of today's Gospel from Matthew. It's usually celebrated during Christmas week. The slaughter of children ordered by King Herod is an effort to protect his throne from a potential usurper. He attempts to thwart the action of God in history. And of course he fails, but not without doing a lot of damage. Not without murdering the innocent, as mad kings have done since the beginning. Dreams also play a role in this story. <clears throat> the wise men in a dream are warned not to return to Herod, and an angel appears to Joseph in a dream to tell him to take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Long before modern psychologists started interpreting dreams, people all over the world assumed that their dreams told them something wonderful and portentous. Put everything I have been talking about together, let us say that the theme of the story of the three kings might be the sky above and the earth below, or the heavens above and the world within. There is something wonderful above us and within us, beyond our usual ken, as above, so below. 
In today's story, we have strangers come from afar, find a hidden treasure, to show the people of Bethlehem something they had not noticed. Sometimes it works that way. Sometimes it works the other way. So I have a story to add, one that I've been meaning to tell for a while. I've been waiting for the right readings and the right Sunday. We have had a lot of busy Sundays recently, so the opportunity has come up, has not come up. Sermons have been necessarily brief. Now, don't worry, this is not a warning to you that this sermon is going to be unnecessarily long. But there is a story coming. Uh, it's a true story <clears throat> about visitors from afar and people near at hand and how they somehow work together for mutual benefit. One day, not long ago, along the Atlantic coast, somewhere south of here, I mean way south in North Carolina to be precise, there was a town that had fallen on hard times. Unemployment was high, upwards of 25%, and that's high. There hadn't been a new building put up in years. The place looked awful, and people in general felt pretty awful about their town, even though most of the people who lived there had grown up there, and they loved the town and loved the region. So the town council hired a development firm to come in, look around, and make some recommendations. I think the state of North Carolina might have even pitched some money in to make this all possible. The firm included an economist, a town planner, an architect, you might say the usual suspects for such an operation. Now this is a true story. It was told to me and written up by one of the people involved. His uh, name is Randy Hester, and he is a landscape architect, and I studied with him at Berkeley. He taught a course called um, Sacred Spaces, and that is ultimately what uh, this story is about. He taught a course on sacred spaces, as I said, and the article that he wrote about this town, where he was born, I might add. He was born and grew up there in this town. Uh, it's called Landscapes of the Heart. So the outside experts, we might call them the wise men, in this case, from the west, not the east. If you go east from North Carolina, you run out of room. <laughs> so they came to town and they looked around and um, studied the maps and stuff, and interviewed a few people, and uh, made some recommendations. Now I should add that when a town is at 25% unemployment, the town is usually willing to try anything to bring industry to town. They will invite a soot mill, a toxic waste dump, a nuclear weapons storage facility, uh, pretty much whatever you could get at that point. And uh, the wise men from the East thought they were pretty wise, and that their proposal was pretty good. They um, proposed simply tearing down some rather worthless looking old buildings and filling up some old vacant lots with new buildings and so on. But the voters had to approve the proposal and they turned it down flat and by a substantial margin. Now let us say that the wise men were puzzled and the townspeople were disappointed. At that point, the outside experts could well have said, well, okay, let's collect our fee and get out of here. We don't care if these dumb yokels don't like our plan. There are plenty of other towns that do like our stuff, so let's just shake the dust off our feet and get out of town. And the townspeople, to their credit, did not say, all right, enough of these so-called experts. Give them their check and give them the boot. Whoever wanted to hire these bozos in the first place, they did not say that. Well, I would suspect a few of them thought of this. Instead, they all agreed to move on to round two. They held a number of meetings, and the outside experts listened while the townsfolk showed them that some of the buildings slated in their plan for destruction were quite dear to people, even though they didn't look that good to outsiders. Some of the apparently vacant lots were also very, very important places, especially the ones on the waterfront, and they came up with a new plan that satisfied most people, and the town is now thriving with just the right mix of new development and old preservation. This is what happens when you have a meeting of the minds. <clears throat> you might say, getting back to our biblical story, 
that Herod represents the old uncompromising way of doing things. Let's call it my way or the highway. That was definitely Herod's MO. The visitors to the kingdom brought him important news about how this world might change for the good, and he chose to ignore it, or strangle it in its crib, if he could. And wise people show up in our lives from time to time. We have a choice whether to heed their advice or ignore it. And the knowledge of tradition, and of course the Christ child, is beyond, the beyond in our midst. The new being, the new news, the new something that's coming into our world, into our ken, that we must bid welcome to the new. While, of course, remember this story about the town of Manteo in North Carolina, the new has to fit itself into the old. There has to be a meeting of the old and the new. So how do we welcome the new while being faithful to the old? How do we discern what is right for us? So the Feast of Epiphany, this story about the wise men, is not intended to offer us figures to admire, but a journey to join. Their quest reveals the need for a guide, the star, the dreams, and the discipline of discernment. And when we acquire that gift of discernment, we more readily do what the Magi did. We bow down and offer our gifts. In the flow of grace that comes from that encounter, we come to discern correctly the voice that guides us where we are meant to go. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.
for part of her life, Betty, who is a joy and a blessing to me. And I'm very grateful to her. Even to this day, I feel her presence. She gave me Michael, whom I love so much, who gave me Sarah. Thunder on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thank Mom. Uh, she was really the only mother I knew. And uh, even for it was a short time in my life, not by my choosing. But um, she gave me Michael and Bert, and I would never have had um, them had it not been for Mom. And my goal was to live to be 100. She would have been 100 today. And uh, <laughs> everybody's like, oh, she's not really going <laughs> to. <laughs> I have a joy, a step son in law in South Carolina that has been bedridden in the office seat for quite some years, walked the parallel bars the length of them. My daughter called me and told me that now she's fighting with him because he wants to get on a walker. <laughs> <laughs> I surprisingly heard via email from my oldest cousin, who's she's in her late seventies and very alert, but not not hip to email, very <laughs> just not. And I've been pestering her for years to communicate with me that way. So I send, I print out letters and send them through the mail, and so she finally she finally responded with an email, a nice letter full of news about her family. She's Got five children, ten grandchildren. So it's a delight to delight to hear from my cousin Susan. Now will the deacons please come forward?
Accept, O Lord, these gifts of our offering. We dedicate these gifts to your work in this church, in this community, and around the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. amen. Thank you. 